Great to meet some of you already. I know a number of visitors tonight. Uh, a warm welcome, literally a warm welcome to you. Uh, my name's Ed. I'm on the staff here. I'm one of the new curates. It's, it's great to have you this evening for our series. We're carrying on this series in Hebrews 11. You know, that, that portrait gallery of, of so-called heroes of faith. And tonight, it's Jacob. So we've got a reading. We've got Sarah Parker, your mum. She's done the reading. I know. Exciting. She's going to give us our reading. Hebrews 11, verse 21. Hebrews 11, verse 21. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. <laughs> nice and short, isn't it? Lovely. But I tell you, gosh, there are riches in that one verse, I, I assure you. Um, but I hope you've had a good summer, by the way. I uh, hope you've, some of us have had a chance to get away on holiday, perhaps, with family or friends. I hope so. I, I was just, in fact, just yesterday I got back from um, the south of France, Provence, avec le lavender and the pine trees and so on. And, you know, it's 35 degrees. It was uh, very brown grass. It was lots of French accents. You know, it was a real home from home, I have to say. It felt like Clapham on sea. But... Um, <laughs> One of the highlights was watching this French ball game. You know, you know the game, I hope. French ball, you know, so someone throws a little ball and the rest of the family have to get their ball closest to the little ball. And I sat watching this um, contest one particular evening. In fact, I took this photo. It's quite nice, isn't it? But there they are. This is a family. There was a sort of... The patriarch of the family was sort of lingering around. I guess he was the grandfather leaning... Well, he was leaning on one of these, actually. A grand pair in French. grand pair. And he was sort of giving tips to his family on how do, you, how do you throw a ball in a way that defeats others and gets yours closest to the little ball. And it began so well. It was such a, it was a joy to watch this game, I have to say. It was, it was, it was beautiful. I was, in, I was in, in the English person there. There were, there were smiles, there were chuckles. There were, it was great fun. But then suddenly, the stakes were raised. <laughs> and these French, well, they were French, I heard them. Were, as, 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 as they, they were speaking of French, well, they were French. And so, <laughs> lovely, lovely French. And... Um, you know, amazing, amazing sort of um, moves as they throw their ball. You know, almost like the boat party, actually. Sort of weird, amazing moves. But then things really changed because suddenly, once there were smiles, suddenly there were frowns. Because as they got to this point here where they're analysing which ball is closest, gosh, the smiles turned into frowns. And there was tension in the air. And it wasn't a game anymore. It was almost life and death over some plastic ball. It was incredible to see. This family, once it was a, a calm water, suddenly the water's are choppy and there's tension in the air. Happy family, unhappy family. And I take it all of us in some way this evening know that feeling in our own families, even this summer. One minute you can be very happy, the next unhappy. And it reminded me of those words of well, Leo Tolstoy, my first day as a trainee solicitor in the family department, this is what my boss said to me. He quoted these words to me. He said this, All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. I don't know where that was from. It's from Tolstoy. <laughs> but those were his opening words. And we'll all know tonight the the joy of family, but also the sorrow, the sweetness, but also the sourness of family life. And you think, gosh, where on earth is God in this? Perhaps you're just looking into the Christian faith, and you think, I don't know about all this, to be honest. My, if you saw my family, and if you saw the mess in my life, I don't know what you'd make of it, let alone what God, if he's there, would make of it. Do you know that feeling? Or perhaps some of us have been Christians for years, and we think, gosh, what is God I doing, please? Well, what we see in Jacob, in this little verse in Hebrews 11, is something quite remarkable. We see how the grace of God reaches in to the mire, the messiness, the brokenness of the most dysfunctional family there ever was. We often see that dysfunction as a barrier, as a hurdle. But for God, well, it's a gateway. And it's still true today. 
So let me say a prayer, and we'll dig in to discovering more of the grace of God. A grace of God that is, well, it's stubborn. It's the stubborn grace. There's a stubbornness to God's grace, firstly. There's a sure hope of God's grace. And thirdly, if we've got time, we'll see how... What is the third point? Uh, Oh, yeah, it's a slow work. I'm slow. It's a slow work of grace. That's where we're going tonight, over the next 20 minutes or so. Shall I pray? Father, we thank you for your word, the Bible, written, uh, breathed out by your spirit. And that same spirit is amongst us now, for which we praise you. Please would he open up your word and open up our hearts, please, to whatever our need might be this evening. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Great. So uh, our opening verse, you'll remember, talks about God, uh, Jacob blessing his grandsons, Joseph's two sons. And you know, we, we, we go through this list in Hebrews 11, and we think, yeah, 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 heard that name, heard that name, heard that name. But we should be shocked, to be honest, to see that word Jacob on the list. It should make us shiver a little bit, because Abraham and Moses and um, no, they sound like good guys, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Jacob, as we'll see, he is a right piece of work. He is a right mess. He is a scoundrel through and through. And yet he's a hero. You know, have you got people in your family where you've got photos on the wall of of your favorites, as it were, (laughs) on the wall, your mum and dad's house, but there'll be one photo that, that, well, it's turned away from the mantelpiece, or at worst, it's shoved away at the bottom of some desk. Well, that's what we'd expect with Jacob, because of the fact that he's a scoundrel. Let me show you why. If you look back to Genesis 25, which tells us this great story for 20 chapters about Jacob, it'll be on the screen. You'll see uh, Genesis 25, verse 22. Look what he's like as he begins his life. He's jostling, verse 22, with his brother Esau. They're twins, and they're jostling right from the word go. He's a jostler. He's he's got an attitude problem. He wants to be top dog. (laughs) And that's even before he's opened his mouth. Then what happens? They're born. Look what happens. Esau's born first with a hairy sort of body. And then out comes Jacob, his hand grasping Esau's heel. In the Hebrew, that word grasping is a sort of idiom for for deceiver. (laughs) And the Old Testament writer, he's, he's sparing with his words, but he's painting a picture, a character, temperament of what this guy is like even before he said a word he's a schemer he's a grasper (laughs) and then look what goes on Uh, next thing you'll remember the story perhaps in Genesis 27 where he colludes with his own mum Rebecca he's my mummy's boy he's Rebecca's favorite and him and mum get together to say right how could we get the blessing the firstborn the inheritance that's owed to Esau and they come up with this great plan (laughs) this scheme this plot to dress up as Esau, you know, put on hairy sort of, I don't know how they did it, I don't know, there, wasn't, there wasn't H&M to go and get a nice hairy top, but I've got a twin brother, actually, he's very hairy, he's got a great big bushy beard, which I could never grow, and it's very grey, I must say, but anyway, so maybe put on a beard, I don't know, but that's what they do, they collude together to trick their own, his own father, This is inheritance, tax fraud, everything in the criminal book. That's Jacob. And it goes on. The next verse, I think, talks about how he deceives Laban, chapter 31. Laban was his uncle. And he does this clever thing where he gets all the best sheep, and Laban gets all the dodgy sheep. And so Jacob becomes a very wealthy man. Laban becomes a pauper. And it goes on and on and on. His daughter, later in Genesis, is sexually assaulted. And you know what does Jacob do? Nothing. He doesn't bat an eyelid at what his daughter's been through. And it goes on and on and on. You think, what a, what a piece of work. What a messy man. And what a dodgy family. You think, please, put that photo away. We do not want to remember him. We certainly don't want to celebrate him. But he's here. He's here in Hebrews 11, and it blows up our categories. 
Because you and I and our culture certainly can be so binary in our categories, can't we? You know, whether it's Wagatha Christie, Vardy's the queen the next day, the next she's fallen from grace. Or it's party gate. MPs one day we love, the next we hate. It goes on and on, this sense of you're a hero or you're a villain. You're a goody, you're a baddie. That slave trader statue, get it down. You, you messed up, fall from grace. We're so binary in our categories and we draw, we've got to draw the line somewhere. Of course we don't. We'll stand on different sides of the line on those issues I've just mentioned. Fine. But what we see in the life of Jacob, it's as if like Jesus did in the sand, he rubs out the line and he changes the categories completely. That's what grace does. It levels us all. It says you're all in the same category. However nice and smart you might be or however messed up and screwed up you are, you're in this category. The category of of being a human and therefore broken and fallen and sinful and in need of help. That's the category we share with Jacob. And so what we see is matching the stubbornness of Jacob throughout his life, we see God's stubbornness of grace matching, no surpassing the stubbornness of his own sin. That is what God is like. Have you got room in your head and on your desk for a God like that? The scandal, the, the stubbornness of his grace? Because that is, that's what he's like. He grabs Jacob by the scruff of his neck and he's kicking and he's squealing and he's filthy. And yet God, for his covenant people, holds them, holds us and will not let us go. That is stubborn grace. It is amazing. And that is our hope, our only hope. The stubbornness of grace. And of course, Jesus Christ, Jacob's great descendant, model that and still models it today he was called the friend of sinners our friend so can I say then on this issue the stubbornness of grace there'll be some of us this evening who if we're honest with ourselves we think I don't know if well if HCC let alone God really is for me you've been coming perhaps for a while maybe this is your first time and you think, I don't know about this my family, right mess, me, my life, yeah, not sure. This is telling us the grace of God reaches to people like Jacob, people like you and me. There's room for you and there's room for me in the heart of God. But I guess there'll also be some of us, perhaps many of us, who we, we know this in some level and we believe it and we, we rejoice on some level and yet it, it seems to take a lifetime for that grace to to, to, to go deep, <laughs> not least in how we treat other people and how we see other people. So that boxing, that labeling, that line drawing we do, we do it all the time. Even in church, I tell you. We think, oh, I'm not sure about that person, you know. I'm not quite sure if they're quite my bag or, you know, quite cool enough or they're not as good at bull as I am. I, whatever, I don't know what your categories are, <laughs> but we have got them. And grace levels us to the ground. And we've got to be proactive again and again in modeling that and living that out. So, I don't know, one idea could be this very evening, even if you're very shy, why don't you go up to someone you've never spoken to, someone who you think, oh, they're so cool, or someone who think, oh, they're so uncool. You know, I'm, you know for example, you know, um, yeah, who wears chinos? Uh, come talk to me. But do you know what I mean? Please, that's the challenge tonight. You can model something of the stubbornness of grace that you will go and talk to someone you you wouldn't normally talk to because that's grace in action. So that's the first thing then, the stubbornness of grace. Number two, what else do we see in Jacob? Well, we see the sure hope of grace. And I think this is the big thing really in the whole of Hebrews 11, but particularly in the life of Jacob. What was our verse saying? You remember in Hebrews 11, it says how Jacob... As he stood there dying, leaning on his staff, he worshipped, but he blessed Joseph's sons. That's his two grandchildren. He blesses them. I don't know what you think of that word bless, you know. You say it in 
in when someone sneezes, oh, bless you, or, you, you know, funny way of saying thank you, oh, bless you, thank you, you know, <laughs> some, people, some people do that. Uh, or I think of, actually, I think a, a better way to think of blessing is a, is a resolute determination of someone to, to seek the ultimate good for another. So, for example, my granny the other day went to see the matriarch of the Veal household. I went to see her down in Eastbourne. Gosh, Zimmer frames in Eastbourne, they are just everywhere. If, if you want a Zimmer frame, get cheap rates. But granny, I stayed the night with her. That morning I left on my bike. She said, Ed, there's thir- to Edward, she said, there's 30 pounds, she said, on the table for you. Please take it. I said, no, granny, I don't need that. I'm a clergyman. Um, and then she, no, she, she, said, she said, no, 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 please. Um, I want you to have it. Go and buy some bull. No, she didn't say that. Um, I said, no, 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 please. I don't need, I don't want it, granny. And then third time, she, uh, she said, and she got really stern. <laughs> she said, Edward, you will have it. She was determined to bless me. I didn't deserve it. I didn't particularly want it. But she wanted and was determined to bless. And, and it, bless is weak in our English language. But here in the book of Genesis in particular, blessing has the word, a, a weight, a depth to it that, that we miss out on the English. It's this sense that God has this heart, Father, Son, and Spirit, with a desire to bless and bless and bless. Like a, like a river. Here's the Zambezi River in Zambia. It, it starts at the source. You can't see it. It's 2,500 kilometers long, the river Zambezi. I don't, some of you have probably been there. But you go to the source. It's tucked away, hidden away in a little village somewhere in northern Zambia. And yet the river goes on and on and on for 2,500 k eventually reaching the Indian Ocean. And about halfway, you get to Victoria Falls, uh, 100 meters, it's a kilometer wide, 100 meters high, the biggest waterfall in the world. The pinnacle of the river is this point. And then it flows further on, further on. And this is the thing, with the blessing of God, it's like this, you and I, 21st century Londoners, we're way downstream. We're way past the waterfall. The waterfall is Jesus Christ and his great blessings that he brings through his death and resurrection. Uh, but we're, we're, day, we're, we're downstream heading for the Indian Ocean, for the home we long for. But the thing is, you go up and up and up the, 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 the stream, upstream. And what do you get? Well, you get the Old Testament Israel. And then you go further upstream. You get to, well, you get to Jacob. And then you get to Isaac. And then just before the source, the heart of God, comes Abraham. And this great promise from Abraham, uh, to God, uh, from God to Abraham, look at this. Look at the affirmation. Hear my granny in it, perhaps. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And then finally, Genesis 22, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sea on the seashore. You and I are the sea and the, uh, the sand and the stars there. We're descendants of Abraham. But you see there, don't you, this resolve from the heart of God, I will bless. It's a husband saying to his wife on their wedding day, I will. In sickness and in health, in richer, whether richer or poorer, I will. This is covenant commitment. This is promise with a passion. And that is the heart of God come through Abraham and now being passed on to Jacob's descendants that's what's going on here but the thing is you know with Jacob well when this happens in Genesis 48 he's at the end of his life he's over here in in, in Egypt he's been there for nearly 20 years and he's been promised land God's God's land with God's people knowing God's blessing and yet he's not there yet and yet he's still hoping Longing, trusting, having faith with a sure hope that God will be faithful to that promise. As he was to Abram, he will take his people there. So, whereas I got cash from granny, Jacob got a check. 
you can't, I can't go and spend this. I can't use this now. I need to go oh, frap around, go to the bank. You know, who uses banks and checks anymore anyway? And I have to do that on Monday when it's open. Then, I, uh, in other words, I've, I've got the promise, but not yet the blessing. I, I've got the blessing, but not yet. And so often, here's the problem: you and I, we want it now. We don't want check. We want cash. <laughs> we want God's blessings now. And the message of Hebrews 11, and this I think is what we need to, certainly what I need to hear, is that the Christian life, so often, it's about waiting and longing and hoping because the best is always yet to come. Look at these verses in Hebrews 11. This is the melody of, of Hebrews 11, which we're, hang, we're tapping into the tune. Verse 1, which Rory, remember, uh, Tim, someone remembered at the start, sort of, we hope for what we don't see. And then later, they didn't receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. They were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. And then finally, the the chapter ends with this. All commended for their faith, yet none of them received what they had been promised. God was providing something better. Do you see that? We want the cash now. (laughs) But God says, Ed, HTC, I'm sorry for so many of my blessings. In fact, most of them. You're going to get a check. It won't bounce, I assure you, he says. But it's not yet yours. And the thing is, we want things now, now, now. I wonder what it is for you. Those things which we might think are the promises of God to which we're entitled, but actually are only gifts of God which he gives freely. I don't know what it is. It could be... It could be that job, that plum job. Then I'll get fulfillment if I just got that job in that bit of government or that shop or a job. Then, then I'll be okay. Then I'll be fulfilled. Or it could be that relationship. Oh, I wish I had someone next to me side by side. Maybe I have children. Whatever it is, is that the longing? Or maybe it's that family issue to be resolved once and for all. Or maybe it's the property ladder. You look at the prices in South and think, oh, And yet that's the thing, that's the horizon. And we want stuff now. (laughs) And the thing is, well, for a start, those things aren't necessarily promised. They're not. not. Not in this life, at least. But also, the Christian life isn't just about the now. It's about the then. And we're called to live in that hope with a sense of longing of yearning. That's healthy, normal Christian living. Yearning, groaning. Just as Jacob groaned for the promised land. Let me show you what that might look like in practice. There was a little boy I knew some years ago at one of my old churches, and he um, he was seven or eight, little Shrankan boy, and he was diagnosed with leukemia so poorly for so long. Um... And I went to see him in hospital. Um, and talking with his dad afterwards, his dad was, as you'd imagine, heartbroken. And they'd been praying for months, really, for God to heal. And they, they'd been told, I'm sure with good intentions, but unhelpfully by some different people, that they needed more faith. He's not well because your faith is too weak. Oh. And this guy sat in his car in tears as he, as, he, as he pleaded and berated himself for this lack of faith. And we had to think together how God does promise a day of healing. He does. And a day of liberation. And he might wonderfully, graciously, miraculously give healing in this life. Of course he might and can. But he doesn't promise that. And so what I did as I sat down on this bed, uh, on this hospital bed with little, this little boy, I got a satsuma, <laughs> I had a satsuma in my bag. And I said to this guy, let's call him Neil, Neil, you know, your body and my body and in fact our whole world, it's, it's, it's like this satsuma peel, it's broken. But the thing is, you know, Neil, that Jesus Christ, because of his own death and resurrection, promises a day, well, when the brokenness will be healed, the satsuma put back together again, 
No more sourness, only sweetness. That's what he promises. And that's what we're all to long for. And so can I say, this evening, whatever those longings are that you have, that as C.S. Lewis has said, sometimes we're so shy to admit to, he calls it an inconsolable secret, this longing, this desire that sometimes we latch on to anything, it could be sex, relationship, beauty, travel, best job, whatever it is. Can I say and implore you as I implore myself, let those longings, those desires, as it were, be, be stepping stones, homing beacons to when finally and fully those longings will be satisfied, when we're with Jesus Christ, when he restores his world. Then and only then does the check get cashed. And you know, Jacob's longing for that. He was longing for it. And to be Christian is is to join him in that longing. So this week, please, join in with the longing. Let those longings, desires point you to him, the end of longing. That is the sure hope of grace, the fact that faith longs for future blessing that's secure because of Christ. And then finally, very briefly, we'll just see something quite lovely. We'll see the, the slow work of grace, the stubbornness of grace, the sure hope of grace, and now the slow work of God. Because here's the thing with Jacob, you know. <laughs> Here we go. Not mine. I won't tell you whose it is, will I? No. Um, here's the thing with Jacob. He's there at the end of his life. Genesis 48. He's leaning on his staff. And he worships. And you read the Genesis account for 20 odd chapters. And this is the first time the writer says he worships. In other words, it's taken him. He's more than 100. He's, he's, been, he's had his OAP bus pass for 50 years by this point. He's 130 odd. And it's taken him, it seems, that long <laughs> to worship, to learn the secret of worship. Incredible, isn't it? You know, the work of grace in our lives is a slow work. And therefore, we need to be patient, patient with ourselves. So often we want to be the strong, sorted Christian. You know, water, duck, yeah, off a duck's back. You know, we're sorted, we're strong, we're mature, we do, 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 do. We want to be strong, now, but so often the Christian life is about then and, and, and what trajectory we're going to be on and, and being patient with ourselves, being patient with God, as it were, to do his work. And, and therefore patient with other people. You know, why aren't you more godly, you? Come on, where's your faith? You know, we wouldn't say that, but we might think it. Well, this is God's slow work at his pace, whenever, however he wants in our lives. And that's, to be honest, a great reason to get to know older Christians. I, I, I wonder how many of us know well a Christian who's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years older than us because they, they will have pearls that you and I can only dream of. So uh, why not meet, next, you know, come next Sunday morning, for example, and meet someone out of your usual age group and get chatting and ask what the Lord's done and hear of their faith. You know, my grandpa... The other, on the other side, this is, his, this is Spurgeon's checkbook of faith, about 200 years old. This book is about 80 years old. It belonged to my grandpa. And he has got, in his schooly handwriting, he's got T and P. You think, what does that mean? It's tried and proved. The promises of God, he's tried them out and he's proved them. And, oh, it's beautiful. I, 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 I can't, I'm just too young in the faith. I can't write like that yet. But I know an 80-year-old who can, and I need to learn from them. So he's got to worship because he's aged. So let's be patient. But then finally and briefly, he's got to worship because he's leaning. He's leaning. In our verse, we're told this. I think it's on there. He worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. You think, why is he leaning? I know, and we think, well, he's old. Of course, of course he's old. You know, he's, 
He's ancient. Of course he's leaning. Yeah, okay, that's one reason. But he's also leaning because he's got a limp. And why has he got a limp? Well, it's because in Genesis 32, I think, he wrestled with God. I don't know who the most famous British boxer is at the moment, but imagine if I was wrestling with him. <laughs> you can laugh, you know, it, just, it would be hilarious. I'd, well, it would be painful. But I, 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 well, I, I just wouldn't do it. I'm not going to wrestle with the world number one. But Jacob does. He says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And this odd scene with this angel, Allah God, seems to be near defeat by Jacob. You think, what? But then what does God do? He taps him on the hip. Like you and I were tapping your phone, seeing what the time is. He taps them. And suddenly, Jacob, he, he switches from from wrestling to resting, to, to scheming to surrendering. He is there hanging at last, weak and frail and a broken man in the arms of God. <laughs> because you see, that is what faith is. It is coming to God, not feeling strong and sorted and self-sufficient, which we so want to be. It is coming to him and even letting him break us with a severe mercy if need be. Because then and only then will we find ourselves hanging in his arms and arms that hold us in love and in grace. Arms that, of course, as we remember in just a moment, arms that were spread out in a stubborn grace, a self-giving grace for me and for you. <laughs> you think, wow. What a God. The stubbornness of his grace. The sure hope of grace. The slow work of grace. So let's just take a moment, shall we? And say, like Jacob would say, Lord, I come in my brokenness, in my frailty, in my sin, in my own stubbornness, to please be met by you, Father, Father, who in Jesus Christ meets me and embraces me. And he'll wrestle with our hearts till we get there. But he'll do it. That's his grace. So let's take a moment's quiet and I'll pray and then we'll sing.